Good morning, everybody. I have a question to you. Have you ever felt stuck? Like you know you have to make a decision, but you just don't have the power to. Technic, could I get my presentation? Merci. So if this is you, or if, if you ever been in a situation like that, welcome to your personal therapy session this morning. I want to know who of you has seen the film Lord of the Rings. All right, there is one certain scene that spoke to me. You know, in the Lord of the Rings, there is the bad guy. His name is Sauron. And he tries... Sauron. Sauron. And he tries to take over the whole world. And there is one king who would, who would need to step up to fight back. His name is Theoden. The king of Rohan. But... This is what he looks like. Have you ever felt stuck? <laughs> have you ever felt like I have to make a decision but I just don't have the power to? Maybe you have looked like that. And then there is Gandalf coming. He's the good guy. He's the wizard. And he says, oh, you have to stand up and to fight. But Theo then says, oh, now it's too late. There is nothing that I can do. I'm not strong enough. I tried before, but it didn't work out. And he even has a counselor who tells him exactly that. He tells him, don't even try. Have you ever felt stuck? Today, I want to speak about one enemy and how to overcome it. And this enemy is called passivity. And I want to speak about overcoming passivity. But first of all, welcome to your therapy lesson. We have to ask, okay, how do, what are typical symptoms of passivity? And how, how can you overcome them? Well, first of all, first aspect of passivity. Procrastination. Procrastination is, I'm supposed to do something today, but I might as well to do it tomorrow, right? Or next week. Yeah. It's like you, you say, I, I, I am going to do it. I promise to do it. You don't have to remind me every, every year again. Yeah? I'm going to do it eventually. This is procrastination. Second symptom of passivity. I don't know if there is a uh, French word for that. It's overthinking. You think, you think about it. You think about it again. You read a book about it. And then you think about it. You thought about it for eight years. You never do anything. Uh, anybody been there before? Right, okay. The third one is resignation. What you see with Theoden is he, he doesn't believe that he's able anymore. He, he's full of shame. He has resigned. And he is, um, he, he's, he's depressed. And of course, what do we do if we are depressed? Yes, distraction. We are living in an age of distraction. 
Yeah, the distraction only is 20 centimeters away. So if I don't feel like showing up, if I don't feel like learning, like working out, or like praying, oh, I might as well just check my WhatsApp. Just see what's going on on Instagram. And then there is this new series on, on Netflix coming out. And this is all so easy. And this is our generation. Especially yours, but also mine. So we have to learn how to overcome the spirit. Yeah, without condemnation. Because this is all us. This is typical for us. But let's learn. Where does it come from? Welcome to your therapy lesson, King Theoden. So here is Theoden. And he's not really happy. Right? He's supposed to be a king. But he's, he's sad. He distracts himself on Instagram. So how did this start? How did it start in your life? Or in Theoden's life? Why doesn't he want to fight? Well, maybe he never learned how to fight. Maybe he never had to learn how to fight. Maybe others fought for him. Maybe he had the strong generals fighting the wars. Or, or maybe his parents said, we're going to do that for you. Maybe King Theoden was overprotected. It's good to be protected, but if you are overprotected, you never learn how to fight, right? First possibility. We are living in an age of overprotection. Gonna speak more about that. But many parents believe it is love to protect my child from every harm. So we never learn how to fight. Second possibility. Let's jump over this and come back to this later. Second possibility. Maybe he doesn't want to fight because fighting is evil. Fighting is so harsh. Maybe he's more like a nice guy. Maybe he learned to be the nice guy. Maybe in his family he always was the nice guy. Right? He was the one who was adapting. There are people who are always nice. They always adapt. They never fight back. Maybe you're a girl and you've always been the nice girl. Yeah, I'm so nice. And some people are over-adapted. And if you're over-adapted, you never learn to step... You never learn to stand up for yourself. Th third possibility. Theoden had a counselor. His name is Grima. You see that in the movie very clearly. He's whispering in his ear. Don't believe this. Just relax. Take it easy. But this is not a good voice. It's actually a toxic voice. The third possibility, why Theoden doesn't want to fight. I don't know if this is right, but it's a toxic voice. We see a biblical story where there was a king who was passive. And he was passive because there was a toxic voice in his life. The king's name is Ahab. And his wife's name was Jezebel. 
she was a, 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 a magician, a, 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 a witch. And there is an interest, interesting um, situation. We read, Alors Chezebel, sa femme, lui dit, Est-ce que bientôt, maintenant, qui exerce uh, la souveraineté sur Israël? She says, You are the king of Israel, aren't you? You are the king of Israel. Lève-toi, prends la nourriture et, et que ton cœur se réjouisse. Moi, je te donnerai la vie de Nabot de Israël. So what she's saying, uh, the back story is, Ahab wants to have a certain garden that doesn't belong to him. It belongs to Nabot. So Je Jezebel, his wife, tries to trick him. Just stay at the home, eat and drink, and I will manipulate everything so that Nabot will be killed. So, at the forefront, this sounds nice. Rejoice. Take it easy. Don't be stressed out. Come on. Life is so stressful. But it's a manipulative voice. And maybe there is a voice like that in your life. This could be a person. It could be an internal voice. That sounds nice. No, no, take it easy. Don't risk too much. But it's a voice that holds you in passivity. Fourth possibility. Well, maybe you have already tried to step out. But it didn't work. You, you, you know, you have an enemy. And this enemy loves for you to stay down. See, the thing is, we all fall. We, we all. It's very normal to fall. Right? If a child learns to walk, if the child would always start, uh, always stop walking once it fell, it would never learn how to walk. It's about the getting up part. But your enemy wants to keep you down. And he does it by trying to make you ashamed. So, on term means you just, you don't believe in yourself anymore. There is another movie that I like very much. It's called The King of Narnia. You seen that? Okay, there is a very interesting scene about that being ashamed part. There is a young king. He needs to learn how to fight. His name is Peter. And Peter is attacked by two wolves. But the thing is, he does have a sword. Actually, his sword is strong enough to kill the wolf. But the wolf is very intelligent. He says, ha, who are you? You're going to put away that sword unless somebody gets hurt. You are not a fighter. You believe you're a king? <laughs> uh, this is the strategy of the devil. You do have a sword. And you are able to fight back. The enemy only has words. He only has blah, 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 blah. Just for you to stay down. It's the, it's the same with King Theoden. Once he steps up, he's powerful enough to fight Sauron. And I'll tell you something very clear. No matter what battle you are facing right now, you are strong enough to fight it victoriously. Don't believe the lie. And maybe there is a little Theoden inside of you. Maybe you are a sports guy. Right? But in relationship, you're a dwarf. Maybe you're a guy. 
Ja, yeah, you're strong on the, on, on the sports field. But if you address a woman, you're afraid to even ask her for her number. Or maybe you're really good in your job. But, but in your spiritual life, you never actually get your feet on the ground. Or the opposite. You're a good, a good prayer guy. You're always worshiping the Lord. But with job and education, now that you are 38, still living at your parents' place, and worshiping the Lord, but never actually learning how to fight. This is your day to stop that nonsense and to learn how to fight. Because there is this guy within you who is called to and able to fight. So let's learn four things about passivity. The first thing is passivity is not security. Sometimes we believe, right, if I don't do anything, uh, I'll stay safe. Sécurité. Sécurité. La passivité n'est pas sécurité. I think before the Ukraine war, we believed that. All the Christians, they were pacifists. They believe if we are nice, everybody will be nice to us. But this is not true. You have an enemy. And there is a spiritual pacifism which does not work. It's just not the way it is. In a war, if you, if you don't fight back, this is the most dangerous situation. It's interesting, St. Paul writes about the armor that we carry. Have you? Ephesians 6. Have you heard about that? There's a shield. There's a sword. There is a breastplate. There is one thing not, not protected by the Ephesians 6 armor, which is your back. So if you run away, you're the most vulnerable. If you just turn around and address it, it's already better. Passivity is not security. But also, passivity doesn't make you happy. Sometimes we believe, if I'm passive, everything is relaxed. But you were not made to relax. The same with King Theoden. Grima says, why trouble an already troubled old man? <laughs> But once he starts to fight, he looks like this. I want to make this very clear. You were made for a battle. Think about your body. Your body is made for resistance. If you give your body everything he wants, just stay in bed all day, drink sugar stuff, and eat, eat pizza, you will not be happy, and you will not be healthy. Your body is made for a certain level of stress. Your mind as well. Just imagine a teacher, like a, a, sports, a sports trainer, like let's say you want to learn how to play football, and he tells you, 
I don't care if you show up or not. Just take it easy. Just have a Coke. And if you feel like training, you can come. Will this be fun? No, this is no fun. You want a trainer who, who actually challenges you. You yourself, you need to be a trainer to yourself. See, sometimes we, we treat ourselves like, oh, if it's stressful, I might as well skip today. I tell you a sad truth. Most people in the young generation don't like this truth. Stress is not negative. If you try to escape every, every type of stress, you will end up like Theoden. There is a certain level of stress that you need. I'm not talking about perfectionism. I'm talking about that internal strength that you have. And that only grows if you overcome your passivity. If you do sports, only if you like to do sports, you will never train yourself. Training means doing it if it's no fun. And this is, the this is true for all aspects of your life. And sometimes we believe resistance is bad. If you are in a war, resistance is a good sign. Right? Imagine sitting in a trench and shooting in one direction, but nobody is ever shooting back. This is not a good sign. I'm shooting in this forest for two days and nobody's shooting back. It's a great war. No, it's not. You're shooting in the wrong direction. There's nothing there. If somebody's shooting back, this shows you you're doing something right. Expect resistance. The problem with passivity, it's pretty much en vogue today. It's a, it's a current mode. It's, today, it's very normal. The la mode actuel. I showed you that picture before. This is a book that came out in German. And the title says, Teacher postpone the test. It's my son's birthday. There is a tendency in modern parents to overprotect their kids. And this is our generation. And they, those kids never learn how to fight. We are living in a generation where many people just want to have their peace. And oftentimes, we learn it from the family already. Most parents today are nice parents. I, I don't want to, want to hurt the feelings of my kids. Teachers, tell me that. They, they approach me. How could you give this mark to, to my son? He was trying so hard. Yeah, but, but it was not good. Yeah, but I love my son so much. So, could you please postpone the test because it's his birthday? 
and we produce a generation that, that is unable to endure a certain limit of stress. Um, I, <laughs> I talked to some managers and they told me it's very difficult to hire young people today because they have very high expectations of everything except of themselves. There's a friend of mine who told me that. They have a hiring talk. So uh, I expect to have 35 days off per year. I only want to work four days a week. You know, hashtag work-life balance. And I want to be encouraged by my, by my boss every day. Right, but then if you ask them back, all right, what is your expectation, expectation on yourself? Oh, I don't know. I tell you a sad truth. It, it's not your boss's job to encourage you every day. It's your job to prove to your boss that you are worth your pay. And oftentimes we don't learn that. Because this voice, the parent's voice, sounds so nice. But actually it's not nice. It's this voice of Grima. Oh, don't be stressed out. Yeah, take it easy. And again, you have the same enemy within yourself. There is a, a positive self-empathy and a negative one. What is positive self-empathy? Just being good to yourself. If you're hurting, taking care of you. Searching for help. Don't condemn yourself. This is positive self-empathy. But, but there is negative self-empathy as well. Which is this voice? Oh no, come on. You don't even have to fight. Stay in your passivity. And this is not true self-love. Last, last point about la mode actuelle. We are living in social media age. I love social media. There is just one tendency that goes along with it. Just imagine I post a selfie of mine on Instagram. By doing that, I give permission to everybody to vote on my looks. It's interesting. Would you stand up here on that stage and ask people, do you like my face? And have a vote on that? You would never do that. Because it's actually very frightening. But it's what we do on social media all the time. We expose ourselves to evaluation by strangers. And the what's what comes out of it is that we are more and more super sensitive towards negativity. Oh, there is somebody who didn't want to give me a like. Oh, there was one negative comment. And we're living in a culture that more and more tries to protect people from negative emotions. I tell you, I show you a very shocking chart. This is an international study that just came out. It was on universities. Probably you will not be able to see that. This study, students were asked on university if there are certain opinions that could offend certain groups. Should this opinion be cancelled on a university campus? Cas, 
So, so what is more important? The, the freedom of opinion, the freedom of speech, or being nice to people? Green is 2018, and blue is 2022. So, in 2022, 61% of the students said, it's more important that no student feels discriminated or offended than free speech. This is, this is the university. In 2016, it was 37%. Why am I telling you that? Because we are living in a generation where we are un more and more unable to have really discussions. Because we are so afraid of offending anybody. But in order to have a discussion, you need to risk negative emotions. You are a Christian, right? If, if you tell people what you believe, some people will not like it. Get used to it. Because if you are no Christian and tell it people, some people will not like it either. No matter how you do it, we think way too much about what other people think. I tell you a, a, a sad truth about what other people think. If you walk around, what will, what will other people think? If I really say that I believe in Jesus, what will people think? I tell you a sad truth. They don't think about you at all. Because they are all running around asking themselves what the people think about me. They don't even think about you. So you might as well be yourself. You might as well be free and break out of this nonsense of over-adaption. Let me make one more remark about that sur-adapté thing. Where is it? The sur-adapté? Ah, there is. You, prob you probably learned that in your family already. And we are living in a generation where being nice is such a high value. <laughs> not not, not ah, confronting anybody. Always be nice to anybody. You cannot be always nice. Sometimes you have to stand up and say no. Because if you are too nice to everybody, you are not nice to yourself anymore. If you are too nice, you will lose your self-respect. This is true to in relationships as well. If you always over-adapt, you never learn to say no. You never learn to stand up for your position. You will be nice to everybody except yourself. And you will, deep in the inside of your heart, you will, you will hate yourself. And you will lose self-respect. And you should not lose self-respect. Because you are a king and a queen. And you are loved by God. You are not created to fit in only. You call to something much more. And we have to learn to step out of this being nice all the time. One last point, why this passivity today is en vogue. Because we have an overkill of negative, emotion, uh, negative informations. I show you one picture. Before I show you that, let me make that very clear. 
climate change is real and it's an important topic. We all feel it, right? So I'm not trying to say anything in that direction. But the way we communicate about this topic, for example, really annoys me. So this was a graphic done by German national television. And it says a baby that's born today will in his or her life encounter three times more um, whatever extreme earthquakes or stuff or floodings. It tells you all, all the different things that this poor baby will experience. If you read that, you really feel sorry for the baby to even be born. Well, and this is sometimes the mentality. And there are many young people who say, I'd rather have no kids anymore. We're living in such bad times. Yeah, be like Theoden. Just be depressed and go to a demo. The manifestation. And, 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 and be sad. Because there is one truth in that picture. That climate change is a big challenge. But there is a truth that they don't say. Which is, yeah, this might be true. We have more, whatever, earthquakes and stuff. Or extreme weather. But much, much, much less people die of stuff like that than 50 years ago. Much less harm is done by those events. And yes, there are negative things uh, with climate change. But there are also a lot of examples where we are adapting in a very good way. And I am so annoyed by this constant stream of negativity. When COVID started, it was just millions going to die. And then millions are going to starve. And then when the Ukraine war started, yeah, there will be a nuclear war. Probably us in Germany, we are even, we are number one with the passivity, uh, the negativity. But I think it's spreading all through the Western nations. And really, I hate it. And I'm not, I'm not doubting all those negative things. But if you consume, 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 negativity, 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 it doesn't, it doesn't give you the courage to actually do something. It makes you sit down like Theoden. Where is he again? Ah, there is Theoden. To say, you know what, I might as well not even try it. Like Martin Luther King, he said, I have a dream. Today's young generation, Greta Thunberg, she tells us, I have a nightmare. I want you to panic. See, I, I can't stand that stuff anymore. I want to see a young generation that steps up to say, we have hope. Yes, the Ukraine war, this is really bad. Yeah, and, and COVID is bad. And, and, and the climate change is a big challenge. But here we are. We were made for this hour. This is what King Theoden eventually did. He stepped up and fought. And he became happy with that. He took his crown. He stepped up to his challenges. And he fought his battle. And I want to see you step up to fight your battle. Right? Being, starting with sports, being, starting your personal prayer life, 
be it step up in your job to really accept your professional career, be it asking this girl for her number, whatever it is, this area where you're stuck, where you're blocked, and maybe you, all, you feel ashamed, and maybe you have a toxic voice in your head, step up, take your sword, and fight your battle. But why don't we make decisions? Why don't we want to fight? Because sometimes we feel that every fight means also the possibility of dying. Every choice is a little death, right? And therefore, we, we don't want to make decisions. If I decide for that one job, it means 20 other options are blocked for me. If I decide for this one woman, it's a no to all the others. If I decide to do this for the next year, I cannot do the other things. So, yes, it is a death. And I have a very bad news for you. Life is a constant curse of little deaths, a constant um, se uh, sequence of little deaths. And at the end of it, you're going to die. So, and it's actually, it's true with King Theoden. He eventually died on the battlefield. But he died victoriously. And he died honorably. So you are going to die. Every fruit that matures will die. If a fruit doesn't want to die, it will never be mature and you cannot eat it. And this is a very deep spiritual truth. Jesus speaks about that very clear. We don't like that kind of talk so much. But Jesus says, if you want to follow me, you have to say no to yourself and take up your cross and follow me. I, 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 I love one thing about that verse. Jesus says, take up your cross. He doesn't say, take up other people's cross. Fill up all the expectations of other people. He also doesn't say, you have to carry the cross of the whole world. You have to be the savior. He doesn't even say you have to carry my, Jesus' cross. You don't have to die on a cross like Jesus did. But you have one cross to carry. It's yours. And a cross always feels like dying. Well, it's like, I don't like that. Yeah, but the cross is the sign of salvation. And it, see, Jesus died, but he became the source of life for all of humanity. You will die, but you can decide if this will bear much fruit, like a fruit that dies, a grain that dies and falls into the ground and bears much fruit. Or you overprotect yourself. You don't want to die. And this is too dangerous. And, 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 and there I lose something. So I'd rather stay at home. And you don't die, but you rot without bearing fruit. So at the end of the day, passivity 
is the refusal to die. Le de And the refusal to die le is the refusal to live. And you have to, uh, this is something very deep. Living, needs, uh, living means dying. And the question is, are you willing to live in a way um, that is fruitful? A fruitful life is, is, a, life of, is a life of love. And love always is suffering. And love always is giving. Love always is also dying. But it's the greatest and most positive thing. Maybe this is one reason why so many young people don't want to be parents anymore. In a time like that, I could never, I could never uh, give birth to a child. So you're saying life is not worth living? Oh yes, my life is worth living. But your child's not? This is crazy. Right? If your life is worth living, then give it away. Yeah, but having kids, you know, I have to get up at night. And then I educate those kids, but then they don't behave well. And I'll ruin my career. And I'll, I'll ruin my body. Yes, that's true. You will do that. But this is what love is. Some weeks ago, you know, Mustafa said that I love the people who are non-Christians. I love the Christians as well. But if I'm invited to a non-Christian place, I love that even better. So I spoke at that conference of occultists. So there were no Christians at all. They were anti. Right? So I spoke there. They didn't crucify me. They were pretty nice. So I went back to my room. And one of the staff members brought me pizza. And he brought me the pizza and he started a conversation. And he said, uh, you know, it's a pretty heathen place where you came here. You know that, right? I said, yeah, I know that. And then he said, yeah. I've, I've been watching your YouTube videos lately. It's interesting. The Jesus stuff. You know what I'm doing with my cult? You know, maybe I could combine the two. Like stay in the cult and add a little bit Jesus. I told him, no, it's not possible. It's either or. He said, oh no. I knew that it was a bad decision to bring you the pizza. <laughs> So he went back to his room. But the next morning, he drove me to the, to the train station. We had like one hour in the, in the car. And again, he started the conversation. He said, you yeah, know, that Jesus stuff. Ah, it's interesting. But also, you know, I've been in that cult for 40 years now. You know, I have a position there. It's my community there. I have something to do. Maybe I can combine that with Jesus. I told him, no, it's not working. You have to let it all go. And then he said, but then I will lose all of that. I lose all I have. I told him, exactly. You will lose all of that. <laughs> he asked me, okay, but 
What will I gain instead? And I told him, I cannot promise you. If I could promise you that, it would be a bargain, a deal. But it's not a deal. You really have to die. You really have to surrender all to Jesus. But good news, I told him, you are already far too gone. You are already... I told him, you have made the decision already, haven't you? He asked me to pray for him. And uh, I told him, you think about it. And you really, if you really want to give 100% to Jesus, you come next week to my place and we do it together. Next day, he wrote me an email. He wrote me, after I drove you to the train station, I wrote my email, and after 40 years, I stepped out of that cult. So next week, he was in my place, in the house of, in the house of prayer, on his knees, giving his life to Jesus. See? See? But, but, but the truth is he needed to surrender. And there is something that you need to surrender as well. This is what Jesus says about renouncing himself. This is not hating yourself. Because there is a positive form of self-empathy. Self-love is something good. Self-care is something good. Right? See, but there are some goals, there are some tendencies inside of you that need to die. And there is no either or. Add Jesus a little bit on it. You actually have to give it up. In order to step out of passivity and be free. So, with the, uh, with the Lord of the Rings, Theo then could not make this decision alone. He needed something. If you saw the video, It's Gandalf, he's actually doing something like an exorcism. It's funny because Tolkien didn't even write this in his book. It's Peter Jackson who, who did the, the movie, he, he, he came up with that idea. It's a real spirit battle. So he, has, he actually has to say, Spirit of Saruman, this is the other wizard, leave him. So, you have to fight that battle spiritually. There is a real spirit that tries to keep you down. St. Paul is very clear about that. He says, we have not accepted from God a spirit of fear but a spirit of power. I love the fact the Holy Spirit is not just, you know, worship hill song, battle style. Hmm. But he's also a spirit of force, of strength, of love, and of wisdom. La sagesse, wisdom means to know which decisions to make. This is what intelligence doesn't teach you. You can be very intelligent. You go to all the best universities and your head is full with knowledge but you are unable to make decisions. You know people like that, right? They're just overthinking, reading all the clever books but actually unable to live their life. So we need the Holy Spirit of power 
and of wisdom to overcome that spirit of intimacy, of intimidation. So, ending some practical steps. What can you do? First thing, start with a small step. Right? Don't try to change your whole world. Start with one thing. If you come back after that week, don't try to change all about your life. Write down one thing. Right? Second thing. Do something practical. So, not, I want to become a better person. I want to love Jesus more. No, make it very practical. It could be something like get up at six every morning. It could be something like have a cold shower. I told you I had a cold shower this morning. It's pretty cold here coming off the mountains. It, it was excellent. So it could also be working out physically. It could be, all right, setting 30 minutes aside every day for your spiritual life. I have a workshop this afternoon while I speak more about this, how you actually start a spiritual life. It could also be something practical like cleaning your room, cleaning up your desktop, or the desktop on your computer. Something practical. Third thing, expect setbacks. It's absolutely normal to fall. It's not a problem. Yeah, don't feel ashamed. Oh, I failed to do it. Yeah, of, of course you failed. But it's not a problem. Stay with it. Stay with it. Stay with it about spiritual life. It's not so important if you pray 10 minutes or one hour. You know what's very important? If you do it every day for 10 years. Do it every day for 10 years will make a world of differences. It's much more important than if you pray for 10 minutes or one hour but maybe just once a week or once a month. There is power in the little steps that you continually sustain to do. Fourth step. Look, look for a partner. Today. Your goal, tell it somebody. Who of you have ever been to confession? Right. Okay. I've been to confession yesterday. I love confession. Because once you speak it out, it already heals. It already helps. So if you have a goal, just telling somebody and ask him, maybe once a week he can write me a WhatsApp message to ask me how am I doing with my goal. is already very helpful. Fifth point, you have to fight spiritually. I cannot make that clear enough. But there are demonic forces who try to keep you down. And once you get home and you try to change things, you will have resistance. Maybe people approach you. Or maybe thoughts are approaching you. Or the devil approaches you. And you have to laugh back. And say, if somebody's shooting back, I probably am doing something wrong, uh, something right. Right? If there's somebody shooting back, means I'm shooting in the right direction. Stay with it and resist the devil. Don't believe the lies. 
It's just blah, blah, blah. Take up your sword. Do your things. Don't give up. Don't believe the toxic voices. Even if these are your friends, your so-called friends. If I would have heard, if I would have listened to all the voices in my life, telling me what was impossible, I would have never stepped out of my Theoden mode. Last tip. Ask yourself, who could I be? So, don't ask, who am I? Like Moses, he says to God, but I'm not good in speaking. Or Jeremiah, saying, I'm, I'm too young. And God says, don't say you're too young. Just go. Moses, don't say you're unable to speak. I'll provide for that. Don't stay with that, but I'm too shy. But I'm a girl. But I'm a guy. I'm too old. And I'm, I'm too distracted. And I have a problem with porn. And I eat too much. Yeah, I believe. Yeah, that's just the normal problems people have. I ask you first, who could I be? If God was really good, if the Holy Spirit was really present, and if He would have really created me for this hour, because He has, who could you be? I'm going to jump over that. It's just, there are two spheres of topics. There is your, you can Google that up if you're interested. There is a sphere of influence and, and, and a sphere of interest. If you concentrate on all the stuff that you're interested in, you'll never do anything. You have to focus on your sphere of influence. This is the stuff that you actually can change. So, we are running out of time. Therefore, you can Google that if you want to. So, at the end, your tendencies to be overprotected, to be the nice guy, to listen to a toxic voice, and your shame, This all needs to die on the cross. Jesus has died for all of that to make you free. To set you in a room of freedom where you can actually be yourself and actually step out of passivity. God really loves you He really believes in you. And he really wants you to be victorious. The last book of the Bible, Revelation, Jesus says to one of the seven churches, to him who is victorious and stays within my works until the end, I will give him authority over the nations. Maybe you say, I don't even want to have authority over the nations. Authority doesn't mean suppressing people. Authority means taking responsibility. Authority means creating a space so others can live. And God wants to give you authority. Maybe in your family with your friends, maybe in your community, in your area, in your job, maybe in arts, maybe in politics, in economy. God wants to give you authority. 
But in order for him to be able to give you that, you need to learn how to fight. You see the one guy on the football field scoring the one goal? Before he scores this one goal publicly, he has fought a battle in the hidden place 1,000 times. And this battle was getting up, showing up, training, starting all over after he was defeated. This whole teaching is so relevant for you if you've been defeated. Especially if you tell you, but Johannes, I tried all of that. But I fell. I failed. And maybe you're sitting right now here and you're asking yourself, if this guy knew what mess I am in, I tell you something, you don't know my mess either. Just because I have a microphone doesn't mean that I have a halo. I have the same stuff in my life. There are only normal people in the kingdom of God. <laughs> normal people with normal problems. We have an enemy who loves to make us feel ashamed. To stay down. It's like Peter. He renounced Jesus. He betrayed Jesus. And then he said, you know, I'm going to go fishing. Why? Well, this was his old job. Because before he became an apostle. So he was disqualifying himself. And this is what the devil loves. For you to disqualify yourself. To give up. But then there's Jesus coming. Three days later. One morning. At the lake. Like here. And he asks Peter, do you love me? He, loves, he asks him three times, do you love me? He doesn't discourage Peter. He doesn't shame him. How could you betray me? Jesus does not want to make you feel ashamed. He never did. The woman caught in adultery He lifted her up. The woman pressed down for 38 years. He lifted her up. The woman with the issue of blood. Jesus touched her and healed her. Jesus never blamed people. It's the devil who does. He wants to encourage you. And he only asks you one question. Do you love me? But then, when you love me, even if your love is small, he says, all right, tend my sheep. Stay in my works until the end. Stay with it. Be victorious. I want to give you authority. I invite you to stand up now to pray. Mm -hmm.